The topic of today's lecture is algorithm engineering. Let's start with an example. We know how to compute a convex hull of a given set of points. But let's consider one more algorithm, and this time we will use incremental construction to build a convex hull. We start with some three points initializing a convex hull and process the remaining points in arbitrary order. For each next point R, we check if it lies outside of the so far computed convex hull, and if it does, we replace the edges of the convex hull visible from R by the two tangent edges drawn from R to the boundary of the convex hull. In the example on the right, R sees the two orange segments, and these get replaced by the two tangent green edges. After processing all points, we should end up with a correct convex hull. Is this indeed the case? Well, if we compute the edges of the convex hull visible from R correctly, and we compute the tangent edges correctly, then theoretically this algorithm is correct. But in practice, this algorithm can sometimes fail. For example, we may find that some points are left outside of a convex hull. How can this happen? Well, this is the topic of today's lecture. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. When we design algorithms, we operate with number types, such as natural numbers or real numbers. In practice, these numbers have certain representation in the computer memory. When we analyze the running time, we often only pay attention to the asymptotics. In reality, seconds count. When designing algorithms in class, we often stop at an abstract algorithm description, and we also often assume general position to make the description of the algorithm easier. When implementing the same algorithm, we often may encounter non-trivial challenges, and often our implementations can contain errors. Furthermore, when designing an algorithm, we don't often bother ourselves with the amount of memory the algorithm will use. In particular, a common assumption is that accessing any of the values computed so far does not cost us anything. Of course, in practice, we have to deal with memory hierarchy and the bandwidth of accessing data. Finally, when analyzing algorithms, we assume that elementary operations take constant time. In reality, different operations take different time, and they are often executed in parallel by instruction pipelining. Today, we're going to cover some of the aspects of the difference in designing algorithms in theory and implementing them in practice. In the slide, you can see a schematic representation of an algorithm engineering cycle. We start with algorithm design. After we have developed an algorithm, we analyze it theoretically. In this class, often the process ends here. But in reality, you will want to move on to implementing this algorithm. Finally, after implementing an algorithm, we of course want to test it and maybe analyze it experimentally. In doing so, we may observe some properties of, for example, input data that comes from real life. And this can give us insight on how to refine our analysis of the algorithm. We may also encounter some bottlenecks or get some ideas for heuristically improving the performance of our algorithm, and then we will want to go back to re-implement it. Finally, we may also develop some deeper insights and move all the way to the beginning of the process and change the design of our algorithm. Repeating this cycle several times iteratively, we can converge on a good solution to a given problem. In the following, we will cover some of the techniques for converting a theoretical algorithm design into a practical implementation. Let's come back to the incremental convex hull algorithm from the previous video and see what can go wrong here in practice. First, let's consider the following question. What does it mean that a point R sees some edge VI VI plus 1 of the convex hull. 
Well, if the direction of the edge bi bi plus 1 is in the counterclockwise order of traversing the convex hull boundary, then if the three points vi, bi plus 1, and r make a right turn, then we can say that r sees the edge. Okay, so now how can we test if three points in a given order are making a right turn? Let's define an orientation function that takes three points, b, q, and r, and it returns plus one if r lies to the left of the directed edge, p, q, minus one if r lies to the right of the directed edge, p, q, and zero if the three points are collinear. For example, on the bottom, r lies to the right of the directed edge, p, q, and thus the orientation of p, q, and r will return minus 1 in this case. To compute this orientation function, we can check the sign of the determinant of the following matrix, which can be furthermore simplified to the following expression. So now we know how to implement the orientation test that we need to make the incremental convex hull algorithm work. Let's now discuss how numbers are represented in a computer memory, and in particular we're going to look at how floating point numbers are represented. You may have seen this before, but let's remind ourselves. A floating point number will be stored in some number of bits. The first bit S will denote the sign of the number. The next E bits will represent the exponent, and the final M bits will represent the mantissa. There are two ways how this sign, exponent value, and mantissa value can be put together to represent a floating point number. The first one is called a normalized representation. In that case, the floating point number is given by this expression. Here, notice j is the number of bits representing the exponent. There is also a denormalized representation of a number. The difference with a normalized representation is we have this value 0 before the floating point. A computer can recognize when a number is stored using denormalized representation by checking when all the bits of the exponent are 0. If the exponent does not consist of all zeros, or does not consist of all ones, then it's a normalized representation of a floating point number. Finally, the exponent with all bits set to 1 is reserved for special number representation, such as infinity, a nan, and others. The two standard floating point number times that you can often encounter in many programming languages are a float and a double. In the table, you can see the range of the values that they can represent in their normalized and denormalized representation. Let's consider a small example. We are going to define a new number type that we will call a very short float. Both its exponent and mantissa have three bits of capacity, and thus they both can take values from 0 to 7. When the exponent is in the range from 1 to 6, this corresponds to the normalized representation of a very short float. And when it's 0, it's the denormalized representation. Now, let's answer the following question. What is the smallest strictly positive normalized number that it is possible to encode using the very short float? Well, we need to choose the smallest value of the mantissa possible and the smallest value of the exponent that still corresponds to a normalized representation of a number. That means that the smallest strictly positive normalized number is given by the mantissa equal to 0 and the exponent equal to 1. Putting this together, we will get that the smallest positive normalized number is 1.0 times 2 to the power 1 minus 3, which is 1 over 4. Okay, so indeed, point 25 
is the smallest strictly positive normalized number. What is the next smallest normalized number? Well, let's repeat this exercise. And the next smallest normalized number will be given by m equals 1 and e equals 1 as well. Putting this together, we will obtain that the next smallest number is given by 1.001 times 2 to the minus 2. Okay? And indeed, the next smallest normalized number is 0.28125. We may continue this process for the next few values, and we will find that on the interval between 2 to the power minus 2 and 2 to the power minus 1, the very short float number type can represent numbers with the increment of 2 to the minus 5. On the next interval between 2 to the minus 1 and 1, the increment between the neighboring values is 2 to the minus 4. Finally, the denormalized numbers fall into the interval between minus 2 to the power minus 2 and 2 to the power minus 2. And again, the increment between the neighboring values is 2 to the minus 5. Now, answer the following question. We're still considering the same very short float number type. What is the result of summation of 4 plus 0.25 using this very short float. Surprisingly, the result that you get is 4. The second summand is simply too small to bring the total sum to the next value after 4 that is possible to represent in the very short float number. These types of rounding errors can cause a lot of problems when implementing geometric algorithms. Now let's get back to the orientation test. Consider three points, P, Q, and R. We're going to plot a value of the orientation test on P prime, Q, and R, where we define P prime as P plus U times delta X and V times delta Y, where delta X and delta Y are the smallest increments possible between two adjacent floating point numbers, and U and V are in the range from 0 to 255. So the plot will give us 256 points along the x-coordinate and 256 points along the y-coordinate. If we set the coordinates of p to be 0.5 and 0.5, q 12 and 12, and r 24 and 24, then the following plot shows the values that you can get from testing the orientation on the points P prime, Q, and R. As you can see here, we can not only get the value 0, meaning that the three points are collinear, when in fact they are not, but we can also get a false positive and a false negative. We can get orientation tell us that the points are forming a right turn, where in fact they are forming a left turn, and vice versa. For another triplet of points, we get a different pattern. And still, we have false positive, false negatives, and we can get the result that the three points collinear when they are not. Here's yet another example with very interesting patterns in it. So now let's see what exactly can go wrong in the incremental convex hull algorithm. For the specific details and the exact coordinate values of the points, refer to the paper by Kettner et al. Consider the following set of points. P2 and P3 are very close together, but yet they are different points. We start with placing P1, P2, and P3 onto the convex hull. And next, for the point P4, we checked whether it forms a right angle for the three edges of the convex hull. As a result of performing the orientation test for all edges, we can actually get that P4 does not see any of the edges of the current convex hull. And thus, 
when we finish running the algorithm before we'll be left outside of the convex hull. The problem that occurs here is that a point outside of a convex hull does not see any edge, and thus we are left with an incorrect solution. Other failures may occur when, for example, a point on the inside of the convex hull is evaluated to see an edge. In this case, we're going to get a non-convex polygon as a solution. Another example is when a point that is outside of a convex hull is evaluated to see all the edges. In this case, depending on the implementation, we may end up in an infinite loop or a crash. Yet another failure may occur when a point outside of a convex hull is evaluated to see a non-contiguous set of edges. Then we may end up with a non-convex solution or even with a self-intersecting chain as an answer. When designing geometric algorithms, we rely on geometric predicates. A geometric predicate is a sign of a polynomial evaluated on a given input. For example, orientation test that we have just covered is a predicate. It takes three points as an input and returns a sign of a polynomial on their coordinates. Another example of a geometric predicate is an in-circle test. Given four points, A, B, C, and D, it returns one if D lies inside a circle going through the points A, B, and C, minus one if it lies outside of the circle, and zero if it lies on the circle going through the three points. Can you think of other examples of geometric predicates? In fact, many predicates simply reduce to the orientation test, either in two or higher dimensions. For example, even the in-circle test can be reduced to the orientation test in the three dimensions. The way the reduction goes is for the given three points, A, B, and C, we construct three points in three dimensions. We call them A hat, B hat, and C hat. The first two coordinates are equal to the coordinates of the original point, and the third coordinate is the sum of the squares of the first two coordinates. This operation sort of lifts the points onto a paraboloid. Then a fourth point, D, will lie inside of the circle going through the points A, B, and C. If its lifted version D hat lies below the plane H going through the points A hat, B hat, and C hat. And D lies outside of the circle if its lifted version D hat lies above the plane. Similarly to the orientation test, the in-circle test can again be written as a sign of a determinant, but now of a 4x4 four four matrix. To avoid rounding errors in implementations of geometric algorithms, we can either evaluate predicates exactly, or we can use predicate filtering to make sure that the answer that we get when evaluating a predicate corresponds to the true value. In the first case, when we evaluate the predicates, constructions themselves do not have to be exact. For example, when we compute intersections of some objects, such as lines or circles, we do not need to compute the coordinates of the intersection points exactly, but we still want to make sure that we evaluate predicates exactly. First, let's talk about filtering. Our goal is to get the correct sign of an expression E. We want to get minus 1 when E is negative, plus 1 when it is positive, and 0 if it is 0. Consider the following pseudocode. We start with evaluating E using our floating point numbers. If the value that we get is greater than some error threshold, then we return 1. If the negation of this value is greater than the error bound, then we return minus 1. 
and otherwise we increase the precision of our computation and we repeat. Of course, in this way we will never return zero and at some point we may need to switch to an exact arithmetic. So now let's discuss how we can evaluate predicates exactly. We have to resort to the use of exact arithmetic. That means that we cannot limit the space to store the values of the coordinates that we get. We will have to use a flexible number representation that will use as much space as needed. When our predicates return zero, that means that we are dealing with a degenerate case. For example, we may have three points lying on the same line or four points co-circular. If our input contains degenerate cases, we need to carefully design our algorithms to deal with them. But there is another option that often works well in practice. Before solving our algorithm, we randomly perturb our input to get rid of these degeneracies. We need to make sure that the perturbation that we're applying to our input does not change any of the geometric traits. And for that, we can use a perturbation that is very close to the input. Let's summarize our discussion of robustness issues. First, we often have a trade-off between using exact arithmetic versus the speed of the algorithm. It is often sufficient to evaluate predicates exactly, but not build our geometric constructions exactly. In general, robustness in geometric algorithms is very difficult to achieve, but luckily there exist libraries that take care of these issues for us. Now, going back to the algorithm engineering cycle, we are more prepared to deal with the algorithm implementation step. Now, suppose that we have a robust implementation of the randomized incremental construction algorithm of the vertical decomposition that we learned in the previous lecture. Choi and Amenta in their paper have observed the following weird behavior of an implementation of such a randomized incremental construction. On the right hand side, you can see a schematic representation of the running time that they get depending on the size of the input. The running time was growing slowly for the initial range and then at some point it started shooting upwards almost vertically. So what went wrong here? The answer is thrashing due to random memory access. It occurs when the virtual memory of a computer gets overused and each next operation takes longer time because we're waiting for the data to be loaded from the hard drive. In particular, randomized incremental constructions are prone to such failures. If you have a large data, it is better to access it sequentially rather than in a random order. So what is the solution here? Not to randomize our algorithms? Well, in theory, randomization works really well. It results in simple algorithms which give us a very good running time. A middle ground here is a partial randomized incremental construction. Here we get the best out of both worlds. We get the randomization from the theoretical algorithm design, and we get enough of locality of data to not overuse the virtual memory. So let's design a partial randomized incremental construction to build a vertical decomposition of a given set of segments. The way we're going to approach this is we're going to split the computation into rounds. Starting from the end, from the last round, we're going to assign each segment to that round with probability one half. Thus, around a half of segments will be assigned to the last round. In our example, we will end up with five rounds and the fifth round gets all the red segments. Out of all the remaining segments, Again, we're going to flip a coin, and with probability one half, each segment gets assigned to the previous round, to round number four. Thus, about a half of the remaining segments get assigned to the round four. We repeat this procedure as long as we have unassigned segments. So, in this example, we indeed end up with five rounds, 
the first round contains only one segment, the purple segment, round number two contains two segments, and each of the following rounds, they contain more and more segments. From round to round, the segments are chosen in random order. Within each round, we're going to process the segments in the order that benefits locality of information. So the order in which we process the segments within each round is not random. Now, when we start building the vertical decomposition, we start with all the segments in round one. In this case, with one purple segment. After we're done, we're going to move to round two and insert the two segments that were assigned to round two. Next, we insert the segments in the third round, fourth round, and fifth round. And we're done. To reiterate, inserting the segments within each round is not random, but is chosen specifically in order not to cause us problems with accessing the large amount of data. Despite of this approach in constructing the vertical decomposition in rounds, and in the last round, half of the segments get inserted not in random order, but in some specific order, still we can get a running time that asymptotically matches the same running time from the randomized incremental construction algorithm. The way we're going to prove this theorem is we're going to compare the probabilities in this approach to the probabilities that we got in the standard randomized algorithm. We will prove this theorem using the following lemma. For a given trapezoid delta, the probability that it occurs in the construction of the partial randomized incremental construction is at most 16 times the probability of this trapezoid occurring in a standard randomized incremental construction algorithm. Consider the example on the right. The trapezoid delta is defined by at most four segments, which we will call triggers. For delta to occur in the construction, all the trigger segments must be inserted into the construction before any of the stoppers, which are shown in red. Stoppers are the segments that intersect delta, and thus if any of the stopper is inserted, before the last trigger, delta never occurs in the construction. The probability of trapezoid delta occurring in the partial randomized incremental construction is at most the probability of all the triggers occurring in round i or before for some round i, and all the stoppers occurring in round i or after. Let's consider closer why exactly that is. Let's consider the timeline of inserting the segments in the construction one by one. Let's say this was phase one, this was phase two, this was phase three, and so on. Let this be phase I, and let all the triggers occurring in or before round i. All the stoppers will occur in or after round i, and we will require one stopper to occur in round i so that we are not double counting when we're going to consider delta appearing in the following phase i plus 1. So now, why is this the upper bound? Well, there may be a permutation of segments within round i where a stopper occurs before a trigger, and thus delta never occurs. And that is why the probability of delta occurring in the partial randomized incremental construction is upper bounded by this probability. So let us formalize this. Let Ti denote the event that all triggers of delta appear in the round i or before, and let Si denote the event that the first stopper of delta appears in round i. 
Okay, then we can rewrite the probability above as the probability of the union over i of si and ti, which is for any round i, all triggers must appear in round i or before, and the first stopper needs to appear in the round i and not earlier. So now we can take the union outside of the probability and replace it with the sum. That is because the events SI and TI are disjoint from other events SJ and TJ. Next, we can rewrite the probability of SI and TI occurring at the same time as the product of the probabilities of SI and the probability of ti occurring. And that is because the events si and ti are independent. Finally, we're going to bound the probability of ti occurring by 16 times the probability of ti minus 1 occurring from above. Why can we do so? We are going to use the following trick. First, we are rewriting the probability of ti minus 1 as the probability of ti minus 1 and ti. Why can we do that? Well, given that the triggers of delta appear in round i minus 1 or before, intersecting this event with the event of all triggers occurring in the round i or before does not expand the scope of the events. Now we can rewrite the probability of ti minus 1 and ti using the conditional probability. So it equals to probability of ti minus 1 occurring given that ti is true times the probability of ti itself. And now we're going to bound the conditional probability of ti minus 1 occurring given that ti is true by 1 over 2 to the power of 4 from below. Why is that? Well, let's consider the way we were constructing the phases and how we were placing the segments in those phases. We were going backwards from the last round to the first round and the fact that ti is true means that all the trigger segments did not fall into any of the rounds i plus 1 or, or later. They were not selected in round i plus 1 or later. Now, given that all triggers were present when we were selecting the segments for the round i, each of them had a probability of 1 half of ending up being selected for round i. If any of them would be selected for round i, then the event ti-1 would be false. So ti-1 is true if all trigger segments survive the selection phase for round i. And because there are at most four triggers, the probability of event ti-1 given that event ti is true, is at least 1 over 2 to the 4. And that gives us exactly that the probability of ti can be bounded from above by 16 times the probability of ti minus 1. Finally, using the same operations backwards, we can rewrite this expression as 16 times the probability of the union over i of events si and ti minus 1 happening at the same time. And that is exactly the 16 times the probability of all the triggers occurring in round i minus 1 or before, and the first stopper occurring in round i. And now, considering the permutation in which the segments were inserted into the construction, we can see that in this way we are undercounting the number of permutations where trapezoid delta can occur. Indeed, a trapezoid delta can occur if one of the stoppers appears in round i minus 1. But because we are limiting the first stopper to appear in round i, 
In this way, we're undercounting the number of events where delta would occur. And then we can upper bound this value by 16 times the probability of delta occurring in the standard randomized incremental construction. So finally, we have proven the lemma that the probability of delta occurring in the partial randomized incremental construction is at most 16 times the probability of it occurring in the randomized incremental construction. And now using this lemma, we can prove the following theorem that the trapezoidal decomposition of n non-intersecting segments in the plane can be constructed in big O of n log n expected time using partial randomization. The proof of this theorem will be analogous to the proof from the previous lecture. To summarize what we've learned today, implementation of algorithms, running experiments, and theory go well together. Producing robust implementations is challenging, but luckily there are enough of tools, there are libraries that we can use to help us in our software engineering. And finally, performing experimental analysis is crucial because it can lead to unexpected findings that will allow us to improve not only the implementation aspects of the algorithm, but to develop new theoretical results. For the good practices of performing experimental analysis, refer to the guide written by Johnson. To summarize his points, when designing experimental analysis, we should try to perform newsworthy experiments, place the work in a general context of the scientific area, use efficient implementations, and use general test beds to compare our experiments with those of others, we can use well-designed experiments to back up claims about performance of our algorithms, but it is important when designing an experimental analysis to ensure that others can reproduce your results and also they can compare their results to ours.